Well, in another significant order, the Supreme Court today ruled that recommendations of the GST Council are not binding on centre and states and it only has a persuasive value. Emphasising the importance of cooperative federalism, a Supreme Court bench led by Justice D.Y. Chandrachud noted that the union and the state governments have simultaneous powers to legislate the goods and service tax. The Apex Court held that an Indian federal Centre and state always engage in a dialogue and hence the GST Council must also work in this harmonious manner. My colleague Danish Anand filed this report earlier today. Well, in a significant development, the Supreme Court today ruled that the, the particular suggestions made by the GST Council, they are not, uh, they, they don't have a binding on the union government, neither on the state governments. Uh, the, the Justice uh, Chandrachur led the bench also uh, clearly uh, observed that the parliament intended that the GST Council recommendations, they have, they do have a persuasive value, but ultimately it is upon the union government as well as on the state governments uh, to take those inputs and decide it on, on their own. Besides this, uh, the, the court also clearly directed uh, that the parliament and the state legislatures, legislatures can equally uh, can equally legislate on the matter of GST. So all in all, if we see, a Supreme Court has made a very significant uh, judgment and it has clearly said uh, that whatever recommendations that are made by the GST Council, they don't have a particular binding neither on the central government nor on the state governments. Uh, they, uh, the, the state government as well as the union government, they can give their more inputs as well. So all in all, if we see, this is a very significant development which has come right out of the Supreme Court. Alright, so what does this development actually mean in practical terms to the form and fashion of the GST Council, how it functions, its powers, will it be rendered a toothless tiger or will it be business as usual? To understand this, I'm joined now by Haseeb Drabu. Uh, he's an economist and a former member of the GST Council when he was finance minister of the state of Jammu Kashmir. Sachin Menon, uh, head indirect tax KPMG, is joining us on the show. Abhishek Rastogi, partner Khetan and Company and lawyer to the petitioners uh, who won the case. He's on the show as well with us and I'm also speaking with Najib Shah, former chairman of the CBEC. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us this evening on the India Development Debate. Mr. Drabu, let me begin with your overall take. Um, the order is now finally out. Details of it uh, are coming in as well. And one school of thought seems to be that when the court says that the decisions of the GST Council are not binding, it means to those cases which are under the scrutiny of the law. Overall on taxes and other things like that, the decision will be binding. Is that your understanding? Well, first I'd like to start with the fact that the judgment is, you know, is a clarificatory judgment. Who said that the GST was binding? The Constitution of India. Article 279A, uh, Clause 4, very clearly mandates GST Council to make recommendations. At no point does the Constitution in any provision clarify, stipulate, or suggest that the recommendations are binding. So uh, I see this as a judgment that clarifies the basic fact that is in the Constitution. Now, if there was an ambiguity, yes. It could have resulted in constitutional crisis because if you make the decisions of the GST Council binding, then you are overriding the state legislatures and even the parliament. The ambiguity uh, has been clarified and it's good it has done that. Uh, really speaking, the ambiguity came from Section 9, Clause 1 of the CGSC Act, which is 2017, a central government decision, which seemed to suggest that the center can impose taxes only after GST Council recommendations. Otherwise, the constitutional position is very, very clear that the council can make only recommendations. Now, the issue really is, it, it's not that it's a toothless tiger, it will be business as usual. In the event of a dispute, that this will come into play. The important feature is, what will different stakeholders use this judgment for? I don't see this judgment in itself being anything which is counterintuitive because the constitution is very explicit. As I said, section 2, 7, 729A clause 4, you read it for yourself. It's very clear. Make recommendations. Now, if the states decide to use this to break the consensus in the GST or like in the Canadian case, the British Columbia moved out of the HCF, some states may want to move out. Now, that's when it will become a crisis. Otherwise, I don't see this as an issue 
that deserves the kind of uh, you know play that it has got because the judgment is what the constitution has said right and also the supreme court has an own view on federalism because despite the fact that the constitution doesn't even mention the word federalism supreme court has repeatedly held that uh, it's a part of the basic structure of the constitution so if you were to decide that gst recommendations are binding then you actually have impaired the federal structure which is driven by the state legislatures and the senate i see the point that is being also made which is you no know, which you referred to is that uh, the supreme court has said that central and states have simultaneous powers and that's a very very important clarification besides the one which exists in the constitution so All that's right. my Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you, sir, for that. But you know, I want to understand what it means in 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 practical terms. We've heard some of the responses from uh, the states coming in, especially opposition states. They've welcomed this, and they look at it as a vindication of what they have been saying all along that we shouldn't be forced to accept any and all decisions. Abhishek Rastogi. Uh, your case was from the point of view of an importer who thought they were um, being slapped with double taxation. But it has led to the larger question on the role of the GST council itself. How do you see um, the judgment in terms of what we're asking today? So tomorrow if the GST council decides on a particular rate or a particular exemption, can any state say that we don't agree with this decision? It's a recommendation we do not accept. Uh, uh, absolutely right way uh, to put and uh, to ask that question. Let me divide that answer into two parts. When I argued the matter before the court, we were arguing on five fundamental aspects. That whether this importer is the recipient of the service, whether section 5.3 of the IGST Act, which provides for the recommendation of the GST Council, uh, and which requires to specify the suppliers or the categories of supplies and goods and services. This is based on the recommendation of the council. That was the second point. So the role of the GST council and the recommendation of the council came while analyzing section 5.3 of the IGST Act. And all three other points were with respect, which, of, which were very technical points, the aspect theory, the double taxation, which you mentioned, and the extraterritorial jurisdiction, because in this case, both the service provider and the service recipient, according to us, were outside of India. The Indian importer was not the service recipient at all. So those are the five fundamental questions. And one of that question involved the role of the GST Council. And what happened during the course of the arguments over the period of uh, three, four weeks is that the respond, uh, the revenue submitted that some of these notifications which specify categories of supply of goods or services are based on the recommendation of the GST Council. Now, understand that the technical challenge was to the wires or the constitutionality of that notification or that provision. But that notification came into play because of the recommendation of the GST Council. And hence, the moot point which arose was that in spite of the fact that there is a recommendation of the Council, if there is a provision which comes, can that provision be unconstitutional? Hmm. And will that provision will have to cross the constitutional barrier. That was the moot point before the court. To address one of the five fundamental points, the court had to address and rely right. on the wordings of 279 capital of sure. the Indian Constitution. But Abhishek, if I, can, if I can ask you again, to put this simply, so what does that mean in practical terms? Now, at the next GST Council meeting, if some states don't agree with something, they all have to eventually... Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a vote. Seventy five percent have to agree. One third of the vote is with the central government. If a state doesn't agree to a particular matter, can it go ahead and just not implement it? So I think the constitution is very clear. The GST Council will provide a recommendation. We must not ignore clause six of Article two seventy nine capital A, which provides that GST Council will also be guided by the principles of harmonized system. So to answer your question in simple terms, GST Council always had a recommendatory role, always had a persuasive role. But now if state wants to deviate from taxes, for instance, if a state on a particular product wants a tax to be a lower rate of tax and not a higher rate of tax, then the state will have to justify that why and how that tax must be low 
how it is not deviating from the principles of gst how it is not deviating from the principle of one nation one tax how is it in larger public interest how it follows the principles of harmonized system uh, for gst implementation which are prescribed under uh, clause six of article 279a so i think the role of the gst council was recommendary will remain recommendary will be guided by certain principles including that's uh, true but uh, everyone this, listen to what the gst council said i'm forgive me i'm no, going to I'm, is, I'm going to start putting this in very simple terms because i think that's what people want to understand at the end of the day what the takeaway is the gst council's decision for a long time were all unanimous uh, yeah. but they need not be unanimous right and some decisions have not right. all been unanimous the question is right. so now what happens if a particular state doesn't agree i'm going to take that question to sachin menon yes sachin well uh, i would uh, completely agree with mr dabu that uh, the role of gst council was clear from the day one hmm. it is only recommendatory and it has a persuasive value and the state and the central governments retain the power of taxing those supply of goods and services simultaneously and this concern was voiced even those debates those point in time that what if one of the states go a different way and say that it is not acceptable we are going to amend the rate of tax what the central government or the gst council can do that question was debated even those point in time and we concluded that the best answer to this question is cooperative federalism having a gst council and uh, on the basis of uh, as far as possible on the basis of consensus they agree on whatever may be those provisions which they recommend and now the court clarified that even if they recommend the parliament need not uh, accept it so therefore uh, the gst council was a recommendatory body it continued to be a recommendatory body since all of them are agreeing to a particular recommendation then there is no question of somebody is disagreeing and going some other way and uh, implementing a different law now essentially here even if they make a recommendation gst council has no authority to make a recommendation outside the gst act igst or cgst act and therefore the court also said that when it is coming to taxing import of goods you add this cif value the cost insurance right etc and there you are saying it's a composite contract and therefore it is subject to igst and then you are saying on the other hand that uh, you take out one component of that and say that it has to be seen independently and uh, uh, considering that the importer as the, as the recipient of service you have to pay a reverse charge basis so this double standard is what is questioned by the uh, has been read down by the uh, supreme court right and therefore ultimately what will happen is that the those guys who have been forced to pay gst uh, on these freight charges even if though it's a cif contract they now in the in the in the so light no, of no, so they, they, don't, they don't have to pay any more those who had to pay so will get a refund no i not, i just the, uh, Hazib Drabu just wants to come in for a second. Let me just let him. Let me just answer, to interject. Yes. Uh, I will answer your question directly on which you have been asking. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. What happened? tomorrow? Let's say we have been hearing voices from Tamil Nadu, for instance, that you know yes. this is unfair of sovereignty and all that. What will happen if tomorrow Tamil Nadu decides not to implement a particular thing? Simple issue is that it has to go to the dispute resolution mechanism set out by the GST Council. Mm. under article 279 capital a clause 11 very very clear and those uh, councils interstate uh, the tribunals like we have the water dispute uh, tribunal are only quasi judicial bodies that have original jurisdiction on interstate uh, matters which otherwise fall to the supreme court had the gst council strengthened and gone ahead with the dispute resolution mechanism it should not have reached this level we are on the trisection of three sets of issues constitutional which is very very clear fiscal which is where legislative powers come in and a commercial transaction on which the case was fought now let's disengage these three and when you come to the point that you are asking which is very clear that what happens if tomorrow state a decides or for that matter what if tomorrow central government decides i will not compensate states 
even though GST Act provides for it, GST Council recommends it. What happens then? Now, that's where my point is. As long as the going is good, people are getting their revenues or meeting their aspirations in whatever form. Uh, it will continue. The moment it's a dispute, it has to go to the tribunal, which is provided for under the GST itself. Okay. And that is how resolution will happen. It's not going to be a break of the system. As I said, that in some cases, yes, there is. there are examples of you know, British Columbia moving out of the HRS system. But that possibility will be restricted in here because states at the end of the day have to conduct business across states. And if they move out of GST regime, then there is a problem. How will the trade happen? So mm -hmm. that's where your question is answered. It has to go to the dispute resolution mechanism. All right. So thank you. Thank you for that. I think that was an important clarification because people have been saying all day, does one nation, one tax still exist? Does the GST council lose teeth? Uh, what happens to that whole system? Najib Shah, so if I were to say and understand this simply put that the biggest impact of the Supreme Court's ruling today is going to be felt in the next GST council meet where uh, the acrimony which has been reported will just get sharper. Is that going to be the biggest impact in your view? I hope not. I hope not for the future of GST itself <laughs> that uh, this does not happen. Uh, because, because like has been mentioned, the court has only emphasized what is there in the constitution. Now, uh, the, the, rec the recommendation part of it has to be read with the fact that subsequent clause of the same article talks of a harmonious system. Now, you can't have harmony if each state were to have its own rate of taxes. And like Dr. Drago has pointed out, you also have a dispute resolution mechanism inbuilt within that same provision, Article 279A. So, so I hope everybody concerned shows uh, uh, an appreciation of the fact that we are working in a federal setup, an appreciation of the fact that GST was a long, hard-fought uh, taxation reform Yes. Uh, that it is in everybody's interest to go forward in the same manner. And yes, perhaps the decision will make the states feel a little more empowered to put forth the decision. Will will end up hearing their concerns a lot more mm. thanks to this decision. But I do not. I hope not. I I, I I hope and pray really for the for the sake of the fiscal reform that GST itself does not break because I really believe that it is a reform which was due, which yeah. had to happen, which is still in its infancy five years down the line. We are still settling down. There are concerns which can easily be addressed and resolved by the GST Council. Uh, Sachin Menon, let me come back to you on impact from a business point of view. Is there a concern of any looming uncertainty because of this? Uh, or is there now a feeling that, um, you know, some of the litigation around the application of IGST and CGST now has the backing of the Supreme Court order? Of course, this is a very landmark judgment as far as the GST is concerned. And the immediate impact would be there will be a lot of refund claims uh, uh, coming up. It will be running into several uh, thousand crores of uh, uh, refund claims because many of those people uh, have paid this uh, tax, which is now uh, Supreme Court said that not payable. Especially those cases where those who are not taken the input credit of this uh, this uh, payment which they have made, reverse charge which they have made, they will be especially the petroleum industry or the industries which are or the sectors which are not within the uh, GST purview. Uh, they will have a bonanza in terms of getting the money back. Now, the question is that uh, those who are taken the credit, what happened tomorrow is some officers say that uh, this, uh, what, this is not payable, so this is not a tax, so you cannot take the credit. I mean, we cannot rule out that kind of arbitrary kind of demands also. Mm. So, uh, essentially, this this interpretation would, as the, uh, the, the council argued, that if this is allowed uh, to be taxed twice, once as a composite service and as an independent supply, then tomorrow insurance and uh, the uh, other elements also will be coming under the same treatment. Right. So that's a threat. So I'm sure that this is having implications in other sectors as well. You know, uh, key questions that some states have had, and I'm coming to Mr. Najib Shah with this. 
um, if we are revenue generating states, don't we deserve a higher share of taxes? Another question that some states have raised, and actually the Tamil Nadu finance minister had raised, was why should it be one state, one vote? Why shouldn't the votes be on the basis of uh, how populous the state are? Do you think some of these issues will crop up again, Mr. Shah? I, I'm sure it will crop up again, but then... In the days leading to the GST uh, uh, constitutional amendment itself, uh, please remember that prior to the GST uh, Council, you had this empowered committee of uh, ministers, which traditionally was always been headed by an opposition party, uh, a finance minister of a state. Therefore, these are decisions which were all arrived at after a great deal of debate and discussion, and revisiting each one of these would only unravel GST, it would not help anybody's cause at all. Uh, so so I, I, I hope these issues are not addressed, and only the 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 basic issue of ensuring the concerns of the states are heard are are emphasized by the states and the center shows the sagacity to ensure that it does listen to these concerns because at the end of the day it is federal uh, issues which are which are which are the uh, the the reason for all these disputes and and revenue is of course a matter of great concern on the issue of the states generating revenue GST works on the destination based principle Therefore, I mean, that is it. I mean, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have GST and then say, look, I'm generating revenue. I should get a greater share. Uh, so, so these are issues I think we have gone past them and I hope they're not reopened right now. Abhishek Rastogi, have you opened up a Pandora's box on GST? I think, yes, there, there will be a lot of discussions, debates, and I'm more worried what happens because there are huge revenue implications. So mm -hmm. I am also worried what happens if there is a retrospective amendment. Will we have a second round of challenging the constitutional validity for a retrospective amendment? That's the first thought which comes to me. Uh, there are a lot of questions which are now coming up with respect to balance of power and distribution of taxes. But I think as far as the distribution of taxes is concerned between the union and the state, we today have two provisions in the article uh, 269 capital A and 270. So as far as the IGST on the interstate part is concerned, that is still uh, based on the recommendation of the council. Whereas if it is not IGST, but the CGST element that falls under section 270, where the finance commission will make the recommendation. So I think on the distribution of taxes are also the questions which are coming up. Will there be more debates with respect to distribution of taxes? Because part of it is still based on the recommendation of the council. So that's what the big question is. And of course, there will be a lot of uh, players, for example, oil and gas uh, uh, pe uh, people, alcohol sector, etc., where this cost was a direct cost. There was tax cascading effect. So will the government come out uh, with some retrospective amendment with an intention not to lose on the uh, revenue and to the exchequer? So I think those are some of the interesting thoughts uh, which, which, which are coming up uh, subsequent to this decision. Mr. Drabu, do you uh, see trouble up ahead? The GST Council will meet shortly. A lot of big decisions and in the backdrop of uh, a tough economic situation, which always will lead to different points of views. There always have been different points of views. We had talked about sharing of tax sovereignties, in particular index, indirect tax sovereignties. And <clears throat> GST hasn't come out, uh, out of thin air. It was passed by all its state legislatures. Right, So there is a certain uh, institutional framework. Uh, GST Council is not a commercial organization uh, where commercial transactions should decide the constitutional validity of its uh, existence. I'm sure to, you know, West Bengal used to have a huge issue in the GST Council when it was done. Tamil Nadu will have, so Karna, uh, Kerala will have. So they'll play their politics, which is their legitimate right. But the resolution, the solution of this is to take it out of the ambit of Supreme Court and take it to the dispute resolution mechanisms where these transactional disputes will get addressed. So, the, uh, the, look at it from a constructive purpose. The only lesson to be learned is how do you speed track, empower the uh, dispute resolution mechanism provided for in the GST Council rather than get into issues of constitutional validity because the constitution is very clear and the ambiguity was deliberate. It's not, it was, it was you know, uh, 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 an oversight. The fact that you didn't provide for it and that draws from also the fact that the Constitution of India does not think India is the Federation. 
it is a union of states. Government of India Act 1935, which formed the basis of the Constitution of India, only one aspect was dropped. GUI 1935 said it's a federation of states. The Constitution of India said it's a union of states. Now, Supreme Court may hold it as a view, but federalism does not derive its things from the Constitution of India, as it were. So let's look at it from a constructive purpose. Let's look at it from a fiscal and a constitutional position. Right. The solution is strengthen your dispute resolution mechanism, go there because they are empowered, they have original jurisdiction on it, rather than getting into courts, uh, the constitutional court and the Supreme Court. So the whole composition of the GST Council, where every state is represented and has a vote, was perhaps meant uh, to have decisions towards this end, where everyone has a voice and its own board. Uh, what does this really mean in real terms will have to be seen going ahead, but it's unlikely there will be any big change in terms of rates. Uh, perhaps old bugbears of certain states in terms of how much revenue they get or votes they get may get raised again. But we'll have to see. We'll have to wait for the next GST Council meet. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us on the first lead story this evening.